that information, you need to provide you with that information that you request. Any more questions? Feel free to ask. Question. In terms of well, export, we are exporting our marriage certificate and passport to Spain. We export our marriage products. Majority of the marine products are exported to the U.S. Virgin Islands. That includes the pond. Yes, that's the deal. That's the pond. Any more questions? Yeah, um, yes. Similar. Fish export. Um, is this mostly what you take with them through the, when they're traveling? Or is it that we have customers who are purchasing fish from us? It's both. Both. Good morning everyone, my name is Nikita Brown and I am the head of the Data Information Unit at the Department of Learning Resources. So, what is it like to do? Our department is responsible for reporting on fish catch. So the foundation of our work is the collection of data. We have a team of data collectors that fly mainland insights on a Friday, and what they do is they collect the data from the fishermen. So they find out what it is that they're catching, how much, what are they using to catch the fish, and we uh, incorporated aerial fish again, we removed it, because some of the fishers, they, they don't want to report their sweet spots. So we're going to try and find a way to draw that information out of them because it has, it has its purpose. So, the team of data collectors, they're collecting the data at the land and sites. They're using tablets now, so that goes to a computer. The data is processed, analyzed, and then we report the data. So, from January to September of this year, we have routine data collection that's ongoing. We usually do a frame survey in the first three months of the year. This is to collect information on the fishing activity. For instance, how many vessels are engaged in the comp fishery or the lobster fishery. We collected biological data prior to the COVID lockdown. We, we now have a, we're a part of the PHC firm's database created by everyone, what they do is they report on the fishery statistics for different countries in the Caribbean and Latin America. So we have contributed to that database. We report to ICAC, they're responsible for the conservation and management of tuna in the Atlantic region. We report to FAO. We have done work with fisher pool organizations, so far we've done a vulnerability and capacity assessment under the CC for Fish Project, that's the climate change adaptation project so we've done that in the FA, the conclusion the one in the castle way, and then we have not one on left. I'll get to that later. And the last thing we've done is we are doing historical data compilation. So a number of officials have been saying that over the years their catch has been decreased. So in order to validate what they're saying, we've managed to retrieve data going back 
to the 80s. So we're putting that into the computers now for analysis. So what we found so far based on the landing data, if you look at the, the graph there, you'll see that most of the fishing effort is concentrated in the new fishing. Now if you compare 2019 to 2020, 2019 is in the blue, you'll notice that for almost all of the different fisheries, more fish was actually caught last year. Now if you take a closer look, the lobster catches, they actually declined compared to last year. It was a significant decline. Conk was a small decline. Coastal pelagic, this was due to the nature of the, the species. For instance, jacks. A fish line could go out and catch 5,000 pounds of jacks today, and they would catch 5,000 pounds again for the rest of the year. So it's a hit or miss, and we had more misses than it when it comes to the jacks this year. We also have less fish as we met fish in this year compared to last year. Ocean plant is a slight decrease, and free fat and crystal, it has decreased. Now, with regards to COVID, based on the data as well as conversations with the fishermen, the fishermen in particular, the lobster fishers, they have been having trouble marketing their lobsters. Because, as you know, the hotels have been closed, and all the restaurants, they've scaled back the amount of lobster that they're buying. So, because they're having such a hard time marketing the lobsters, they've actually gone to catch other types of fish instead of catching lobsters. Now, so you would think that the reef and the mercer fishery would be an increase in the catch with most of them are concentrating their effort into the reef and the mercer fishery. But what we found is, compared to last year, now this is pre COVID, during the lockdown, and the lockdown. So the, the one on the right, that would be prior to the lockdowns, and they were actually catching less this year compared to last year. During the lockdown period, production dropped drastically. It was an 83% decline. Whereas, same period last year, they caught a significantly more significant amount of fish. And then post COVID, you could actually see where the catches in the reef and the rest of fishery is actually higher than last year. So the, the decrease in the reef and the rest of fishery is. I think that the public has its hand on to play in that one. Because even though they're catching more now, at the start of the year they weren't, and during the lockdown period, production fell drastically. So what we have left for the year, we'll continue the routine data collection, we'll continue the compilation of the historical data, and we have a vulnerability and capacity assessment for Sandy Point. Activities for the next year continues routine data collection, processing analysis and reporting. We will do biological data collection for common lobsters. We have the frame survey for the first three months of the year, panelization of the data collection system, and continued data collection training. And I mentioned the analysis because now that we're using the tablets, we have a simple data collection tool. The University of West Indies, they actually did a lot of tools, it's a bit more sophisticated, and they managed to incorporate Nevis into the tool. So we hope to roll it out for Nevis next year and do some training with the data collectors. We should be finished with compiling the historical data next year, so we'll do the analysis of that. And because the data collectors are the point of contact for officials in most of the areas of fishing communities. We usually have them assisted with the work of City for Fish, which is providing support to the fisher group. Challenges, lack of fisher compliance. Fishers do not like to share their data, they think that we want to tax them, even though that is not true. So we, we usually get a hard time. And some of them, they don't understand why we need to know what they're catching or how much they're catching. So it remains a challenge. We have a, a saying, no data, no duty free. So what we'd like to see is more or stricter adherence to this no data, no duty free policy. Now for the harmonization of data collection systems and integration, we have obligations to report 
our national fishery statistics, and we also have a mandate to manage our fishery resources. So it would really be difficult if we were doing things completely different. And or if we were collecting what is necessary for us to report or to manage the resources. So this is something that we hope to see next year as well. So this is the end of my presentation. I know there will be questions. Profit margin of 
is up to thirty dollars and thirty one cents. The gross profit margin, however, was a was a positive eighteen percent. Now to table two, in 20, the third quarter of January to September. You will realize that the year started off lovely in January, and the sales were overweight the expenses. But somehow, a slight decrease in the sales for the month of February, where we had $35,247.89 in our sales, compared to $41,085.71 in February. Sales picked back up in March, but then the economy went down and was spiraling when the world experienced the global pandemic that caused a lack of our sales being more than our expenses due to the lockdowns, there were no economic movements happening in the month of April. In May, when the economy opened back up to some extent, the sales picked back up rapidly in the months of May, June, and July. But then we had a slight fall in the month of August and September, as you realize our chart has depicted. Currently, the vast efficiency complex is experiencing a loss in the gross profit margin of negative 14.1%. As explained before, we had a lockdown in April and we also had a breakdown in our freezer for all the storage that we had there, they went on spoilage. The analysis of the revenue. As explained in the tables and the graphs, the gross profit margin in 2019 from January to September in the third quarter, we got a profit of $43,836.31, whereby it's 2020 for the third quarter in January to September, we had a negative of $45,747.21. Bear in mind, the total revenue was significantly less in 2020 compared to that in 2019. In 2019, it was $288,226.88. And in 2020, it was $279,000. $279,000. $279, $279, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289, $289,
Two, are increasing fish processing tools so that the fish can be cleaned in a timely manner. And the insufficient funds, we recommend that we get an increase in the funds. And we have been asking our director, Mr. Mark Williams, and our new guest, Mr. Ron Collins, who I know that are working on it. And they can stand here today and say that they're working on it. Am I right, gentlemen? Am I right, gentlemen? Okay, perfect. Um, development issues. Minister, you see how we have to each other? Development issues. Uh, initiatives. For the fourth quarter, the fisheries for the unit would like to undertake the following priority initiatives. Increase a positive gross margin in the sales and purchases of fish because we had a negative for the third quarter in 2020, as just explained. We would like to also improve and create more opportunities for collaboration and partnership with more local supermarkets and restaurants. As everyone knows, we have partnered with Rams, and there's no more there to prove that is true. And we would also like to provide greater access to assorted products offering to our customers. We have already started selling goods, so and that's my last name. So anyone willing to purchase books, first check the last name which is complex, okay? If you don't want to come, you can always ask the PS or the director, where the directions and they will always direct you to me, all right? Sit back, relax, and enjoy this video of how we fish in the kids and the house.
in Sengels, in Sengels in the novel revision, in the African Social Science. Uh, we are currently more uh, on a research based program as we lack funding to actually do the major stuff. So in doing so, we embark on several explorations using our agricultural development strategy, which was formulated in 2013 as a guide to the, 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 to the development of agriculture in cities and areas. So one of the first things, one of the first questions we have to ask is what do we actually have? Second one, we have it. The third one, how can we actually capitalize on our resources? Okay. Our federation has many different environments all around it, and as such, it lends itself to having different organisms even in these environments. In light of such, it behooves us to capitalize upon that which we have in abundance, which are steam, oceanic waters, and an organism that is thriving. Additionally, as the region has challenges for freshwater sources, the heavy use of fresh water is somewhat discouraged, and we encourage the more use of brackish water, which is water that is sedimenting from 0.5 to 30 parts per thousand, okay? and seawater. Okay? Uh, what do we have? As you can uh, hope you can see here, um, right? we have many unutilized organisms such as sea urchins, sea lettuce, shellfish, such as mussels, oysters, and whales. Where do we have it? As I said before, we have a vast amount of environments around our federation. Um, sadly, currently our, ex our um, explorations have been limited to the sort of same things alone. Hoping the movement may be quite soon and explore over here and see what's actually here so we can actually capitalize the other as well and the organisms in that area. How can we capitalize on resources? The use and adaptation of various methods and mechanisms of agriculture and artificial technology to suit our environment. It must be climate smart, environmentally sustainable, and affordable. Okay. Um, for much of the year, in spite of COVID, we've been able to do some natural harvesting of wild shellfish larvae, experiment with resistance of growing various algae. I'm conducting research partnering with the University of Central Florida concerning our local algae and microplastics and sending these samples on part of this. All of this is being done in hopes of building up a system in which we hope to push the thing which is integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. Right? What is that in my hands? By definition, integrated multi-tropic aquaculture is the farming and proximity of species from different tropic levels and with complementary ecosystem functions sorry, in a way that allows all species, sorry, sorry, one species on eating food and waste, nutrients and byproducts to be recaptured and converted into fertilizer, feed and energy for the other crops and to take advantage of our synergistic interactions among species while biomitigation takes place. IMTA, in a nutshell, basically, from an agricultural perspective, is creating an ecosystem in which we do polyculture, right? Or polyaquaculture, which reduces any environmental impacts associated with the type of agriculture as different organisms are strategically placed in the same environment so as it would help to cover for the deficiencies of the other organisms. Now, the plan for the next quarter is to continue our research for local and our local organisms and their viability for use in commercial sea agriculture. Continue finding the proper channels and supplies, which are the most We will continue with experimentation of different methods 
types of aquaculture and use of various available gears and their adaptation to the system. So, as I said before, um, the overall aim is to build all these systems and more. So as we can supply our people with local food and this produce is an in an environment in a sustainable way. Food that is safe, secure, meaning and guarantee what we're putting in so we will know what we get out as a result. This will ultimately lend to not only a high quality of nutrition for federation, but also as a reduction in our import bill on fish and fisheries products. In light of such, I must apply um, farms such as Mr. Scott Atlas, Dr. Barrett and Brown, and Mr. Afnia Heidegger, who were recently awarded for their efforts in aquaculture in St. John Lewis. Aquaculture has a vast amount of potential, and the Department of Marine Resources recognizes such. It's our aim to use aquaculture to bolster food security of the country and also enhance the livelihoods of our people. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. So, the marine management area and habitat mountain units, and we're focusing on that. Some of the information includes extension as well. Um, we all know what the thing is that means marine management area. There's actually a map of it right here on the screen. So, it's actually a two mile radius around 70 centimeters of not protected areas because we don't have protected areas in St. Vincent and Nevis. Well, the terminology we use is marine management area. However, maybe if you're familiar with marine protected areas, then that kind of gives you an idea of what um, we try to achieve. However, it's much larger than just um, designating a small area. We actually did a two mile radius around St. Vincent and Nevis and it also includes monkey shows. And um, within that area, we have several use zones, including conservation, recreation, transportation, fishing, and mixed use. Okay, so challenges that we experience. Culturally, we have, um, we have learned fear of the ocean, and not to say that it's, it's not, it doesn't have a basis, Usually that fear is associated with some trauma that was experienced with the ocean or some trauma that was passed down. However, what we're trying to do is increase the knowledge of the marine environment and that will help to curb some of the fear. Again, we're not dealing with like irrational fear like people don't know. But yesterday, I spoke to a lady and she's really afraid of going in the water and a whale eater. And I was trying to explain that whales don't even eat humans. But that's not usually the fear we encounter. We usually encounter the fear like um, Christina, for example, person that even wanted to go on boats because they have that fear and it has a basis. So what we're trying to do, once you increase knowledge, you help to curb attitudes and behaviors towards the marine environment. And so we're working on doing that while talking about marine ecology and we have specific target audiences. And it's not just the primary stakeholders of the fishery sector, but also the general public, children, um, citizen scientists. We're, we're really trying to encourage more citizen scientists to come on board, academia and environmentalists. We have to plan to the, uh, to the lens of science. We have to really look at data, something concrete, in order to plan for our policies and our direction that we are going in. We introduced something that's a little different from most of our Caribbean counterparts, where we actually designated the whole coastline to my readers inside of that, usually they just pick one area. However, if you do something at one point and then you protect another, that can still have impact. And so we looked at a much grander scheme in order to create a holistic development. These are some of the documents that we used in our um, plans to come up with the Marine Zoning Plan. In 2010, we collaborated with TNC and USA in order to quantify our marine zoning. We've done significant work since then, and so we have now a, a, a draft for the same and the story management area management plan, which will help us to then move forward and really hold in on creating a more holistic view and implementation of our marine resources. Okay, so what we have been doing is some habitat management that includes like underwater surveys, so we have been diving and um, also doing drop down camera work. And um, we have, we are in the process of looking at deployment of artificial reefs and creating reef nurseries. Now we are doing some collaborations with um, some external entities with this. So I know the EPO and later on I'll also mention the SKN reef gardens. We've been, we are in the process of doing some collaborations to get some of this done. We've also done the deployment of fish aggregating devices, and Carrie would highlight more of that in this presentation, so I won't go in depth there. And also, um, what we 
we can do is provide technical expertise for the documents that have been created. Okay, so something that has been happening is a lot of training and we are looking at the human resource that we have trained over about eight years. Now when we start, when I started at the department, um, it was just really me and Karim, I think at the time, who would have been functioning as super divers. Um, the Sam project and Sam and Ekman, they hired two persons and we trained for that with social media. Um, we export our social media. So what that means is we have to then train the persons who would be posting about the marine environment, about marine ecology, so that they can understand in order to communicate. So in that time, we've done about four persons, two men went to study and one changed her accounts, so we ended up to be four. The Conservative Biodiversity Project, we would have trained ten persons under that project. And also the SPN Reef Guardian Initiative that happened with a collaboration with Department of Youth where we trained 15 persons and um, they had to the program in, the program entailed theory as well as in what activities. And as we get forward to you can see an image. No, the in what activities did not entail scuba diving. We did um, safety at sea work with them and also did a sample, right? And um, we did, so it was youth core and also youth groups, that's who we recruited in order to do this initiative. Now, because of funding, we're only able to do one aspect, but the reef guardians are actually, the ones who graduated from that program have now formed an NGO and they're applying to a small grant proposal in order to do multiple trainings. So, Awesome. It's really an awesome initiative. So we're really happy about that and we will be of course providing that mentorship and technical advice. Right now in the division, we really have the me and Karen who function and everyone else is actually operating in a different division. And so again, I'm appealing for us to really use the human resource that we have trained in order to sort of fill up the um, the division so that we could really move forward coming from a point of advanced knowledge. Right? So that would have been over that time frame, 31 persons in all. Okay, so when it comes to more education and awareness, we have all. So if you are like your smartphones, type in at DMR SPM on all these platforms. YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and you could also try our website, www.dmrspn.com, in order to keep abreast with all of the work that we have been doing. This is another partnership. We'll see the ICSPN, we will do a high visual campaign to promote the marine environment, and so you will notice that the department is now a complete underwater mural. Um, the Dean Gasper School has a an underwater researcher and that Digasa is in a non-fishing community because we try to appeal to not just the fishing community when it comes to positive interactions of the marine environment but also non-fishing community, non-traditional communities. And that's it for me. Any questions?
have about 20 to do in the stomach, and that means that it's competing with us for food security. So um, we had a lot of efforts. There were several um, OECS livelihood support fund that um, actually supported uh, one of our fishers to do lionfish culling, and there were several efforts to cull cull means to kill in a specific area or specific species to cull lionfish. What we have noticed is the lionfish, they have migrated to deeper depths, so it's more difficult for our divers to access them. And so they're kind of doing some adaptation mechanisms to ensure their survival. And so we still have culling activities, but it's not as prevalent as before because of the migration pattern.
Okay, so one color pattern is one, two of all patterns. Uh, the Sandy Sita Alliance Center Network and also the Lean Still Group. So we actually just recently, I can't believe you didn't see it, on our Facebook page, which is why you need to follow us, um, launched a video talking about turtle conservation and the work done by both of these entities. So please follow our Facebook page so you can keep abreast of the work that we are doing. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Karen Sata, and I will be presenting this morning on behalf of the Extension Union um, and the brand of the Marine Resource. Okay, so, Extension, by definition, um, this is what we do. In Extension, I know you guys see that the Department of Agriculture will be able to be there. Um, what we engage in is the sharing of technical information which will be the problem solving, and I use um, the word sharing because it's not just us giving information. A lot of times, what you experience in the field is that what you know by the book does not work. So a lot of times when we go into the field, we are also taught, as well as we teach the individuals there. Um, providing clarity on issues that any of and stakeholders are having changes in the policies and administrative um, extension, again by definition, it is an extension of everything else that happens within the department. So anything that happens on the administrative end, we are usually the first set of individuals and persons we come in contact with, and it's the stakeholders, and not just the officials, but the general public as well. We have to answer questions, we would have to provide information to these individuals. Excuse me. Um, and this, all of this is ultimately geared towards the improvement of stakeholder livelihoods and their sense of responsibility. So that sensitization that we've been speaking about is so that you and the general public would understand that we all have a role to play in the management of our natural resources. Um, 2019 review in the first quarter, um, there was a kind of interface to Smoking workshop. Now, what Kari Fico was was a project that was from 2013 to 2018, which was the Caribbean Fisheries Co Management project. And what the project focused on was uh, implementing co management with fat fishers, that particular fishery. Phase two now is looking at implementing um, similar principles but with our natural resources, which, as you saw from the day of the year, I mean, well, the catches are increasing and stuff like that, and everybody has been seeing about cobalt reef degradation and stuff like that. So phase two is looking at how we can better manage that jointly with the users and stakeholders. Um, providing assistance to officials in flat construction and deployment, that is something that goes on continuously throughout the year, hence the arrow here, so you can just transfer that to the other sections. In the second quarter, we Partner with the University of Ross, um, Veterinary Medicine, um, did the sensitization initiative, and um, it was during one half of week where they were doing um, a cactus along with other stuff. And we, myself and Tricia, as well as a few other officers, participated in terms of helping to provide information to the persons that were here as it relates to any issues that would be um, in the environment space. Um, we also assisted a master's student, well, not assisted, but we are in the process of assisting a master's student at us as well, who is doing research on lobster, which is one of our major commercial species. Um, we participated in the evaluation of the Federation and the World Travel and Tourism Council. Uh, we won that competition, by the way. Um, and what we did as a department played a major role in that. Um, in the third quarter, we began assisting with the IWE project that Tracy mentioned of. And what that does 
it incorporates um, that bridge to the concept of you know, what happens on land affects what happens in the sea. Um, so we're looking at different things that could be put in place to assist with uh, increasing the amount of gentrification along the coast. Also, providing technical advice and equipment, anything that comes in that will be used by the staff are uh, also for sale. Uh, the, those of us in the extension building will provide some guidance in terms of what would be best suited for us here and our local situation. As well as assist with the facilitation of the youth guide training, which Tracy has also mentioned. Uh, this is a picture of the, those of us that were present. Uh, the person in the middle here with the white brown pants that was the evaluator from that, that came. And so this is the, the basically the explanation point. And um, say so it's needed standing out above all other countries around the world that really be sustainable. Tourism price. Um, in 2020, the department had the ESCN evaluation workshop at OTI. As members of the extension building, we have to participate again to provide any technical guidance that would be necessary. Once again, giving assistance to officials, that is something that happens slowly. Uh, providing guidance on the year of reward by the NFSA, as I mentioned before, and providing technical guidance and to assist with the facilitation and completion of the IWA code. So we are not just helping in terms of words, but we are actually going out and assisting hands-on with the facilitation of the activities. And also, this is what we've been focusing on now, post-lockdown, um, the implementation of the activities for that project. Uh, challenges, procurement of equipment and financing of activities. A lot of the activities that we do are costly. The equipment that will be necessary to carry out the job effectively, they are also cost. And this has been uh, a major challenge, as well as competent and public. Um, train staff. If you look at the other side, going forward, we want to do more scientific, science-based work, um, capturing data in real time that would help with the policies. So the questions that you guys have been asking, we want to do more in capturing the stuff that would be necessary to answer these questions. Um, developing your training programs is, would be external and internal for our staff with the education the manpower. Um, the construction of fads, um, any type of fishing gear, the deployment, if a fisher wants to learn, it is, I believe, the responsibility of the Department of Marine Resources being the competent authority to teach these individuals. So we need more staff present in the department who will be able to teach individuals. It was mentioned before that there is a decrease in catches of coastal pelagic, which is the CMM fishing. That is a traditional type of fishing that is being lost. There are very few people that participate in that fishery. And it is sad to say that if an individual who want to get into that fishery, it would be difficult for the department to provide the technical guidance because we need staff training specifically for that. And that would go to any other type of fishing. Um, and also continue to foster commodity efforts. We understand that we are a lot of budgetary constraints that will be placed on us, those are beyond our control. And so common management is one of the ways that we use to bypass that. Um, as it relates to facts in particular, during that project, one of the outcomes of it was not initially supposed to be an output uh, directly of the project, is that officials have now begun to help us alleviate the cost of the deployment and the maintenance of facts. So they will use their own boat. So that's fuel that the government does not have to do. They will provide some of the materials that is an additional expense that the government does not have to do. So as we go along, we want to continue to build this type of connection between the environment and stakeholders that I mentioned. Um, also, as I mentioned before, that there are entities that will participate uh, come to us in, as it relates to the deployment of artificial reefs, stuff like that and we assist them 
that it is while the Wisconsin is provision of materials we do not have to worry about. We will be assist with that distance. And I think that is a big help to us. So we want to continue that in moving forward. Thank you. What we do, we implement a 
and monitoring sanitary and climate sanitary measures, SPS measures. That's a term that you should become very familiar with because we usually say we have implemented an SPS measure. And these take the form of, for example, legislation, regulations, or official procedures that we will implement here at the department. Also, one of our primary goals is trying to prevent the introduction and spread of regulated pests. And these are what we call quarantine pests, which we don't have, or if we have them, they are very, very small um, quantity. And regulated non quarantine pests, meaning pests that affect plants and plants. So, our main goal is to try and improve agricultural health and food safety conditions for the preparation. Our objectives we try to protect the farmers from economically devastating pest outbreaks and we do this through pest and disease surveillance. We also try to protect the environment from loss of species diversity and also in the same way we try to protect the ecosystems from loss of viability and function as a result of certain pest invasions. Also one of our main really objectives is try to facilitate trade to standards and this is safe trade because what we want to see, we want to be importing healthy material and also on this other end, we want to export healthy and good material. And also, of course, we're trying to protect the livelihoods of our families and food security by trying to prevent and where they enter to mitigate pest um, invasions. So just some of our core functions, of course, we issue import permits and phytosanitary certificates. Inspection of consignments concerning plants and regulated articles. And regulated articles here really mean things like aggregates and wood material because they present a significant pathway for the entry of pests, and so we need to regulate them. We engage in pest risk analysis. We also do pest surveillance to a lesser extent a bit of pest diagnostics. We disseminate information to the general public and we prepare, review, and enforce quite sanitary measures and legislation. So getting into the highlights of the different quarters, for the first quarter, we would have informed our families that we would have completed a survey for Tuta Absoluta, which is the tomato leaf miner. Last year, we would have gotten a report of a pest outbreak in Haiti, and so of course the Caribbean moved to do the survey in each of the islands. So the end result of that survey was that the test was not found here in St. Gets. We have an ongoing surveillance program for fruit flies, which affects um, a wide variety of fruits. And so we would not have detected the exotic fruit flies of economic concern that we were particularly looking out for, which include the Mediterranean fruit fly, that's the Serratitis capitata, and the Bactrocera carambola, which is the carambola fruit fly. We would have facilitated in the first quarter a national plant pathology training workshop, and that was geared towards professionals in plant health, about some diagnostic procedures and so on that can be used in a lab setting. Also, in the first quarter, we would have facilitated an aggregate import policy consultation we mentioned earlier. We also regulate um, regulated articles, and so we want to have a policy going forward for import of recycled materials. At the end of the quarter, we would have suspected a bacteria or possibly a fungal disease in Musa, which is banana. But what would have happened if we realized that at the end of the quarter, we would have gotten the lockdown. So moving forward, just go back to that. So moving forward, of course, we would have wanted to do testing to determine what was the actual specific cause of what we were seeing in bananas and plants. Just a visual for you to let you know where we would have had our traps when we did our tomato leaf miner survey here in St. Kitts. Distributed around the island, that was the blue dots that you see there. And in terms of our ongoing surveillance for fruit flies, for fruit fly trapping, um, in fact, today is a trapping day, so staff are out in the field now actually doing that particular activity. And these, where you see the blue dots, are where we have the traps around the island. Moving into the second quarter, I mean, we call the second quarter the COVID quarter because we really saw a significant impact in how we arranged and did our work program to try and work around the 24 hour lockdown. Because of that, we were not an essential service per se, for example, as health, and so we would have had to just concentrate on doing inspections for fresh produce and so on because we were not at that time importing things like cut flowers and those things we were just concentrating at that time on food security. And so we were just inspecting our fresh produce. 
But during that second quarter, though, we would have implemented what we call an inspection sticker. We wanted to have a visual representation of when the officers would have inspected goods and they were cleared. So we wanted the other border agencies as well as the customer to know that we would have approved this particular commodity. So we would have developed a sticker where there's a little picture in there where the officer would sign it and date it. And that has been very useful going forward with some of our border agencies like customs. Um, in the second quarter, we did not have any data per se on the detection of the exotic food flies because we could not um, have been able to go out and track it because of the COVID-19 restrictions that were in place. Um, in terms of pesticide analysis, and this is where we evaluate biological, ecological, and economic information to determine if we're going to allow a certain commodity to enter the country and the type of pest risk that we associate with it. So we looked at one from mushrooms in the first quarter from USA and we would have determined that it would enter based on the analysis of the information. Continuing the second quarter, and we did the staff in the quarantine unit, we completed an online training with CADI, and that was specifically crop pest diagnosis. So we were able to bolster the capacity of our staff in relation to crop pest diagnostics. Um, also, for the second quarter, this whole year of 2020 has been designated International Year of Plant Health. And so what we'll have done throughout the entire year, we will have been um, doing workshops, trainings, etc., whether it be virtual or otherwise. But in the second quarter, because of the COVID restrictions, we decided to use our uh, own social media platforms for advantage and really get some information about the year in terms of plant quarantine or import and exports and about the year in general. Um, we did a lot of virtual meetings and we came along during the second quarter in relation to plant health and the Rotterdam Convention. Um, the Rotterdam Convention deals with certain uh, pesticides and hazardous chemicals in international trade, which I see as the designated national authority for cities and leaders. And so something to note is that we would have completed all of import response obligations for the Rotterdam Convention this year. And that's a very big achievement because we have some of the bigger countries not even doing that. And so that was a really big achievement for us here. In this second quarter, we would have had a report about a mango tree in one particular area. We would have been seeing a black spot on it. And so what we wanted to do is also send out the testing. But again, because of the COVID restrictions, the labs that we wanted to use and targeted, they were also closed. And so going forward in the third quarter is when we actually had the opportunity to take samples for both the banana, which I mentioned earlier, and the mango to get a diagnosis. So for the third quarter, we did a lot of IYK activities in terms of regional training, we did a lot of regional workshops in terms of our IPPC national reporting obligations. We looked at the ISPMs, which is something that we really try to contribute to because we want to have a say in the international stage of how those um, particular measures are shaped and fashioned and that they benefit us. We would have not detected any of the exotic fruit flies, which are the medfly and caracol fruit fly. As mentioned, we would have done the sampling and testing so that we were able to go out again and so on, and the labs were opened up. And what would have been determined is that we would have confirmed a fungal disease in banana and plantain, and also a vexillicolium, because they're the same family, and it's called a black seotoka disease. It's a leaf disease. It's very, we have a very low incidence here in the country. We have a very low humidity. And so we really have a unique opportunity. We've been working with our farmers, having a series of workshops in different districts. The information has been received very well. We've been informing and educating them. As mentioned, it's a leaf disease, so it's very manageable. What we recommend is to be leaf, and then we would apply a protective fungicide to manage and control the problem. So going forward, we will be, of course, working um, extremely closely with our extension staff, because all the extension staff, all the quarantine staff will have been trained in the control and management of this particular disease. And we're in a very good position since we have a plant pathologist on island in the form of the 
her representative for some extensive, very extensive work in this particular instance. In terms of the mango, what the lab came up with was that was also fungal disease, and it's called mango decline. It's really like associated with stem blinds and food rocks, so it's fairly common and fairly general, and it's really associated with mango deficiency. So we've been working in the two spots we will see that particular disease. In terms of PRA, we competed for peanuts in the US and the Senate and the Red Games and we'll develop all those particular commodities based on the information. So just some visuals for you. Can't see very well here, but there are four blue dots in different districts where we will have seen the initial um, black slip of the disease. And of course, we've been working very closely with those particular farms to maintain and control. And the lower down here, in one year in Philippine, one year in Burma, is where we saw the mango decline. Now, I just wanted to give you a little rundown in terms of data comparison for the first to third quarter between 2019 and 2020. In terms of imports, the import permits, we would see on the left the comparison of import permits. For the red, that would be 2019, and the yellow, that would be 2020. Of course, we can see in the second quarter, which is the COVID quarter, there was a decline in the request for import permits. And in the third the quarter, 2020 in particular, the request went up. And obviously, that was kind of to you know, retract from the second quarter with the loss. In terms of the phytosanitary certificates, which are issued when we have persons wanting to export goods, and for us, it's mostly non-commercial consignments. I mean, the persons usually don't want to send dry tea leaves and those kind of things to family members. And so, of course, in the second quarter, again, we will see a drastic decline because persons usually um, hand carry these things, and so they will not be able to travel. And so, we will see a significant decline. Third quarter trying to work their way back up, still not able to travel, so we'll see more numbers there. In terms of inspections, again, in 2020 it was lower, we would have seen COVID again in the second quarter had a significant impact in terms of what we could have done, and in terms of actually how much inspections needed to be done based on restrictions in the country. And on the right, we have a comparison in our trucking activities, we also do trapping for the Anastrip Obliqua, which is the West Indian fruit fly. It's the one and only known endemic fruit fly species here in the Federation. And so we try to monitor the population. So in the second quarter, first and second quarter, captures are generally low. And what we've seen from historical data is that the third quarter is always fine. And we have a lot of fruits in season during that time. So we would always use this information advise our farmers on the incidence of fruit flies and how they can acquire the nutrients in this matter. Just a little insight in terms of commodities that we import. When we do inspections, for example, from the boats that come from the Newman Islands, we will see the type of commodities that are imported, and that will mostly be bananas, plantains, and coconuts, and that's really because they have a comparative advantage here. The government is really on um, support those particular industries as it's the main say and livelihood of the economies. So we get a lot of imports and in a really far distant, I would say second with the things like dashing and animals and so on. But generally bananas, plants and coconuts are the top imports from those islands. So those are areas we can look at for opportunities. The constraints as we've heard about the day. We have similar constraints across the sector, which include lack of resources. And of course, human resources is one area that we need to look at. Our unit is small at five. And so if we're going to advance and do more surveillance activities, do more inspections, we really need the trained staff available to do such so that we can meet our mandate and execute our work program. Financial resources, that's always a constraint. And you know, going forward with the impact of COVID, we could expect budget cuts. So we have to become a bit more creative in how we try to manage and control some of our problems. But we do need these things for some basic things like microscopes and so on, so we can do our work. And 
physical resources, if we're going to increase surveillance activity significantly, we will need access to more people and so on. One thing that we want to do going forward is to improve our legislation. Right now, our legislation is from 1923, and we need to come up to the times. Really, we need to move forward if we want to do international trade and so on, if we want to have market access to certain markets and European market, we need to improve our legislative framework to do that. And also, we want to improve our best diagnostic capabilities going forward. If we have a small little lab where we can do some of our work for ourselves, everything doesn't have to be sent overseas because it's quite expensive. And also, we want to look um, in the future at the post entry quarantine facility. Meaning, if there is a particular plant or kind of product that comes in and we need to observe it before we release it into the environment, we need that type of facility to facilitate such. So, a little preview of what we want to do going forward for the fourth quarter. We will have participated really since October in past in World Food Day activities. We also we always use these type of activities to really highlight what plant health um, does for the community because we want persons to be aware, for example, of what the import protocols are. We've been having a lot of um, requests for things like planting material and seeds, and so persons will need to be aware of what procedures are. We want to continue to raise the awareness, so we've been working on a little video in terms of how we import the plant material, which we find will be useful for the general public. We want to control and manage the dancing over disease and sickness. Going forward, of course, we need to do a survey in the nearest to determine if the disease is there. And then, of course, facilitate a workshop for farmers there on that particular disease. We want to do a tomato leaf mine diagnostic training for the farm to and staff. We will have an opportunity for people to participate in a virtual training. And so we need to share that knowledge with the other members of staff. And one thing I wanted to note, mentioned earlier we brought down convention. Since we did such a good job with doing all our input responses, they decided to feature us on their web page for that particular achievement and actually just sent an email about yesterday and that feature this up. And I just wanted to give you a little preview of what 2021 is going to look like. We are hoping we've already had discussions with the minister and the PS and director, so going forward, we don't want to see the passage of the Plant Protection Act, so we'll get updated in our legal framework. We want to have a more regular presence at the port of entry, so we can have officers perhaps stand there, so we could effectively execute our duties. We want to do more surveillance activities, and we want to prioritize the certain regulated pests of economic concerns, so we could concentrate on those. We want to have more public awareness along this line. We have an initiative with the United States Department of Agriculture. It's called the Dome Pack a Pest Program. We were not really able to roll it out this year because of COVID restrictions and we were not able to come here and so on. But we're hoping in 2021 that we could roll out that program. And of course, we want to see continued capacity development for us now so we could effectively serve the community. Thank you for your kind of attention. Any questions? This is the hard work in staff and the quarantine unit, so I really want to acknowledge at this time all the hard work.
So for us, concerning imports of certain commodities, we stick to the facts. So if there's a pest associated with a commodity and it presents a significant risk to the country, yeah. then we would deny the entry. But long, as long as they can follow, for example, to a certain treatment, for example, chemical or hot water treatment, we're duty bound and obligated by our international agreements to allow the commodity to enter. Okay. Mrs. Alam. It has to be a program that 
gone through a very fabric of fisheries and agriculture. And this is where we need to go. They, it, it, it's true to, they is true to the fact that it is safer. But you have to understand also the, 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 the cost involved. And so it means that our producers need to come up with and understand well, this is when government is providing all of this assistance and we can be more reasonable with our costs we cause individuals to look in that direction. But education will be critical, so that is a, a, a big thing that has to run through all the entire year and it has to be a risk that all of us carry. But we, we, we will need to re energize that whole project, that whole program in terms of ESO so that it can be sustained. But I, I agree that we do. It matters who was with the various stakeholders that you have said. My case is still on the floor. Uh, from my vantage point, I think it would be helpful if you can get the NAD and the Ministry of Health involved. Because they can, the lab is not equipped with certain tests. And they can do the tests and put it out and say, listen, this is local and this is the difference. Not that you want to mind it because the World Trade Organization and the only people take a percentage for the local production and for it. Help you out the same. And I don't think we're capitalizing on that. I think we're hiding behind the fact that all the you know, put in the train and we can't and we can't and we can't. All the aid is in each state. And this is an avenue that we need to look at. For example, we go to your beef. Everybody can say, oh, we need to scarce us. But it's scarce us because we've got to clean the angels on. We are not. And this is an area that I've been neighboring for for years and we need to see some movement around the planet. I, I think we really embrace also trade because whatever allowances are permissible on the land arrangement, trade can advise the ministries involved in health um, and agricultural fisheries to ensure that we can take advantage of it with, of course, the support of the, when we talk about the support of the, the, um, the business community, we can drop a message. Our uh, people will suffer. We have to press this message. We don't have to be more aggressive in it and sustain the effort. So, yes, we will factor that into our programs and uh, make sure it's measurable so we don't drop the ball. Excellent discussion. I know we are all ready to continue that discussion right now. Uh, so we are going to break for just a few minutes. Uh, let's say we will resume promptly at 11.55. If you step outside, there's a light refreshment waiting for you. Uh, so please be back in your seats by like 55 so that we can continue. Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, on the outside, we're ready to start. So I don't like I don't like to be talking to cheap empty chairs.
we should be ready to start. I, first of all, would like to record that because the brother has already been established. Welcome to part two, part two presentation. And I don't think I have to, I don't think I have to say, well, yeah, everybody knows me. I've been here a long, long time. I know where we are. So everybody knows me. My main task here today is to present on the annual health aspect for the department. Now, whenever you're responsible for a particular unit, you must first of all know your role in that unit, what it's all about, and your action plans. Now, in animal health, the main goal is to, to provide meat and meat kind for your country or for the federation on a whole. And if possible we have enough meat, we can actually export some of that meat to neighboring islands. And if we do very well, we can send some of it abroad to those international countries. But around here in the animal health sector, there must always be certain action plans in order for you to achieve your goal. And how do we do that in animal health? We provide the opportunity for farmers in the sense that certain commodities are provided to them and we also have to educate them. Then we also have to prevent exotic diseases and transformative diseases from entering our country. That becomes part of surveillance. I know Dr. Challenger is supposed to be the person doing that, but once you're in animal health, surveillance is a very important and critical part of your work. So we have to do that as part of the animal health unit. Then we have to treat all animals that come down with any disease. So this is the function or the duties of the animal health unit. And all of this is done in a way to provide food, which we refer to as food security. So the main goal here is to provide food for the country. Now, if you look at this table here, those are some of the areas that we're going to be discussing. I did not put everything on PowerPoint because the PS and his team gave me the impression that I would be here just for seven minutes. I don't know how we could present something like this in seven minutes. So I think that we have to take up another seven. My seven minutes have not started as yet, okay? I'm going to start soon. I just have to do this. Um, okay, if you look at slide one, you will notice that we have a gentleman here standing with a box in his hand, and on the box are uh, vertical. Everybody knows what's vertical. It's the account that we use to treat the things that we have that has been causing havoc in this country for a long, long years. We have two teams. And for the purpose of this presentation, I have divided the animal health cases into two parts. One part is going to be dealing with all diseases, and the other part is going to be dealing with dermatophilosis alone. Now, this guy is applied medical to the back of the animal, and that is to prevent or to prevent the ticks from coming onto the animal and also to get rid of the ticks that are already on the animals. This is an animal with stage 2 dermatophilosis. The disease has three stages. One, when you can just feel the lesions. Two, when the lesions begin to coalesce. 
C3 is mainly disease, or the lesions are penetrating the skin and growth with the animal itself. Becomes necrotic, you say rotten, and starts smelling. So this is an animal in stage 3. Now this slide is going to be a little bit just the other diseases except dermatophilosis. And we have divided it into three quarters. There is a blue section, a green section for the second quarter, and a red, or that looks more room to be for the third quarter. If you are to pay proper attention to this, this graph, you will notice, or uh, that chart, whichever one it is, you will notice that castration is actually a very important part in your daily work. It is actually the longest, and that is because a lot of our farm or population prefer their meat not to be rancid with the high testosterone level that we have in the bait on the bowl. So they do a lot of castration, and then we have gastrointestinal parasitism. Worms are still normally say animals suffer a lot from those, especially pigs. So that again is going to be very, very high on the list. Then we have dog bites. We always have a tap from dogs around here. Every morning farmers will complain. They went to bed, they had about 80 animals and they wake up in the morning and they only found 20. So that's the big problem that we have. Then we have some other cases that the incidence is not as high as those. So we go out on a daily basis, take care of all of those cases to make sure that our farmers are happy and in the end that we could have proper meat. Okay, let's move on. If you look at this chart, you will notice that it has been divided. There are three figures on that chart. January to March, we have a total of 339 cases. And in April to June, we have 111 cases. And in July to September, we have 140. Now, notice here that drastic fall between the first quarter and the second quarter. And that was as a result of procuring the bait color, which is the carousel that we use to treat the tail. Dermatophilosis is a disease that the animals get on the skin, those sores. And because we were out of bait gun for an extended period of time, we had a lot of cases. And then with the treatment commencing sometime around February, March, the cases begin to fall. So by June, we only had 110 cases. And mind you, some of those cases are repeated cases. Because once you have started the program, you have to go back and treat those animals again every two weeks. So the figure there you see 111, you have to divide it by probably half or two. So it should be something around 55 or so. And then that's third quarter. Same thing. Okay, so that those are the cases we had for that period. The basic that we have been using, notice that in the July we started with 6,555 liters. And as time by the second quarter, it started mounting. We are using more basic or we have used more basic or we are using more as time goes by. The reason for this is because one, we had a lot of farmers who had animals and we couldn't find them, so they came on board. That happens a lot in the same case. People have animals and they don't know because they don't have to register. And some of them will tell you they don't want people to know they have animals and they hide their animals in the hills. So that's one of the reasons after the disease started hitting, then they came to the fore and let us know that they are farmers and they have animals. Another reason is because a lot of farmers, or we were just getting acquainted with a lot of those farmers and we had to increase. As time goes by, you increase your number. Of, of 
So, in September, it is just a couple months ago, we have used 6,951 liters of vegetable. And those who do the vegetable treatment, those who do the vegetable treatment for the team, that, that, that. Now, there, there are two lines here. A blue line at the top and a red line at the red that you don't so well. It looks very to me at the bottom. Now, let us focus on the blue line first. I want to add to see the correlation between that blue line and the green line. I, it was supposed to be in a presentation, but sometimes it appears to be as if I'm teaching still at the can't help you. So, if you look at the blue line, you'll notice it started rising in July. The blue line is supposed to be representing what is it representing again? Blue German treatment. It means the number of animals that have been treated for the disease. It started rising in July. It went up until August. And then it started falling from August, from right down to September. Those figures I gave you, like the 110 and 140, they are the same. That, those two lines are depicting those figures. I should have actually put them here to show. You have 100, 91, 104, 70. Now, if you look at the other line, you will notice that that line is supposed to be showing animal that are TBT positive. TBT is the acronym for tropical bond tick. That is the tick that causes the disease. Let me put it like that. The disease is really caused by the bacteria, but it is carried by the bacteria. So we normally say the thing causes the disease, but it's actually the, the bacteria that causes it. But anyway, if you notice that the tropical bounty begins to fall from 100 it went to 58 in the second quarter, 24 in the third quarter. And if you notice, if you compare it with that blue one above, you will notice that that also started falling as a result of the tropical bantic falling. So the tropical bantic population fell and the disease also fell. So there is a direct correlation between both of them. So we always try to encourage use your medical fortnight every two weeks so that you will not be affected by really. In summary, since you all gave me a few minutes, there was a subtle increase in the number of diagnosis cases for quarter July to September. And the reason for this is because we are now approaching the wet season. These larvae or these things actually hatch in the vegetation and what we have here is one tick, one amniotic tick, that is the name of the tick that causes the disease, can give you up to 3,000 eggs. So when he gives you those eggs, they hatch from the ground. And what they're doing is waiting until it becomes moist or wet. And they crawl on the top of the bed of the grass. And they crawl up to the animal. So this happens during the drag the wet season. So during the wet season, along with the animal and hide becoming very soft and tender, it makes it easier for the organism to penetrate the skin. Those conditions allow for the development of the disease in the hive numbers during that wet period. So that is why we have those numbers here. There was an increase in medical treatment in the month of September. And we did that so as to curb the problem. Whenever you have rain, you have to increase your frequency of treatment. Because rain is going to cause the disease to We're going to have a higher incidence of the disease. A total of 20,184 medical treatment were used, and this is a lot of money. 
I don't know if there is any other area in agriculture that spends as much money as we do in political treatment. That is a lot of money, so we are trying to encourage farmers. If you want to be asked in the department to spend so much money on political, you're going to be doing a good job in the field. Because we can't give out political free and we don't get anything in return. So that's the problem that we have. There's an increase in the amount of livestock testing positive on the tropical one. And again, that is due to the treatment with the base body. Next. Recommendation the tropical one and the tropical control program should be extended until the 31st of March 2020. And uh, the reason for this is because we see that we are getting to my team, I must commend them for doing a good job. We have two teams out there and they go around daily and they apply medical to these animals. It's not an easy job. Some of them are not animal loving people to that point where they will be. But it's their job and they do that. And I must commend them for their job. <laughs> so they do this on a daily basis. And if for some reason they have to stop, no, we're going to get a clear of the disease again. So we have to make sure that it is under proper control before we stop. And I can give them an example of this. Sometime around 2013, when we thought we had the tropical one tick under control, we sent to one of the surveillance officers, there was nobody to go out and look and see what was going on on the ground. We thought we had eradicated it. And then about a year or two after all the things came right back. So we have to be very careful when we want to put an end to our program. Mr. Minister, I'm begging now to let this program and you don't have to beg anybody because I beg you. So you have to beg Mr. Pierce or the Prime Minister. This program should continue for at least the next four or five months. That's the recommendation from the Animal Health Unit and the Dr. Chaplin. Right? The four quarter is upon us now, and I would like to make some to the plants that we have that we have in the animal health unit. We are organizing two workshops. Two workshops for these farmers. One is pig, pig production and the other one is with ruminant farmers. And the reasons for this is because we have been seeing a lot of diseases, particularly in ruminants that we could avoid. And I think what has been happening is that a lot of farmers, so-called farmers, people just come on stream because they see people raising animals and they come on stream, they don't have any idea of how farming should be done. And they come on stream and then we have to go back over and teach again. So it's a matter of you providing the information and the knowledge to these farmers so that they can be beneficial farmers and not just people say I have two animals. So that would be the purpose of this work, those two workshops. And diseases such as tetanus and mastitis, intestinal parasitism, dog attacks, we could make an input on those and try to avoid or curb that, mitigate some of those diseases that we have around here. Another reason for this is that of our plans for this work is also to find a lot of those farmers who either live in the mountain or in the valleys in the guts with their animals. Because we need to have an updated census when it comes to our animals. In, in cases of disease outbreaks, we could be in a lot of trouble because we do not know where these farmers are, where they are hiding. So we have to find them. These farmers and that falls under the animal health unit plan. So that would be one of the plans for this quarter. And we, another plan is that we're going to continue our surveillance in the field with those ticks. We want to have another team functional. There is a team, the second team is not so functional now because one or two of the workers have left. 
other reasons. So we need to get that team activated again so that we could move forward again with our treatment and surveillance. We don't want we don't want it to hold up because of any other reasons. So these would be our plans for the next quarter. And uh, I hope with those plans everything will go well. Now again, you know the norm is that you don't know where you are, or you don't know where you go, you don't know where you will be heading or where you're going. We have some figures here just to give you an indication of what this disease did maybe in 2019. In in 2019, we had a number of we had a total of 1,289 animals treated for double tap. Our animal population is somewhere in the area from over just over 5,006 in Canada. And we had this amount of animals treated. Now, I'm not saying all of these animals were treated. Some of them were recurring cases. Some animals were treated three and four times and so on. Maybe about 25% of those animals were treated. Of this, 1289, 1140 of them were captured. So it seems then as if Canada has been the main culprit for this disease. I don't know how it was in Nevis, but that's how it was in the same case. In this quarter, in this, these three quarters of 2020, because of the treatment of these animals with beta, Mr. Pierce, why are you looking at your watch? <laughs> I told you that it couldn't be short enough. We had just 232 treatments or diseases in three quarters already, and we only have 232. So that is saying something. Just begin to bait it. It is working, and we like to keep that. So find money to buy bait next quarter. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Andrea. Question. Salman Anna, right? Mm. Salman Anna? Yes, sir. I know, I expect that. <laughs> Mr. Moni. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, I listen to you with deep interest because who feels it knows it. And while I don't want to dig up anything, I just want, I just want to get to the point because you know, you're talking about the big cup and you're being as well as most of your staff would know that if you have a soul and you keep dressing that soul and not dealing with the cause of the soul, you're not making any headway. I'm saying this because you presented a plan when I see people like staff families who is one of the members of St. Thomas Gospel, which I'm going to do today. They have presented a plan, a full body plan. And that was presented in March to, to the PS, the minister. And up until now, it has not been tabled. And I find this to be very disrespectful, outright embarrassing. Because we are the people on the ground. We say, number one, we would like to get permission to burn our eight or farming areas. This is not the rainy season. Grass is growing, grass is green. As we would say, direct. No fire by burn them. Nobody took us on. He said, in addition to that, give permission to get the area power so that whatever tickets in the government can be treated. Three, then get there's a spray that is used in most of these other countries to spray the area to get rid of the tick that may And then look at improving our livestock production by getting a better breed of animal in. And up to now, these matters have not been addressed. I don't want to question your conscience. But how do you all expect us as farmers going into this new quarter to react when we were trying to reach out to you guys before nobody took us on? I mean, could you all to be here?
Mr. Pierce, you would like to answer him? Mr. Salomon, Mr. Salomon, Mr. Salomon, this is the team, this is the team. Some of the things that you have asked for are beyond me. They fall with the peers and the minister. You said the table, some, you said, you said something that has not been tabled. I did not see it. I have not seen it. The peers saw it, so I have to let the peers address it. And while I understand you heard that the well, president experiences when he reflected on this, justifiably, um, we have been trying to move that forward. What I have recognized is that, uh, from my research, that the information was presented to the ministry and uh, the authorities then squashed it. We are taking a different approach as far as the recommendations from the various stakeholders are concerned. So I understand that it would have caused something real hurt and so on. This is the start of a process that is actually happening here. Why we want persons that want to be as transparent as possible. And we will now need to factor in those recommendations that are workable. I understand also that because time has passed, the window of opportunity for the burning um, is somewhat difficult. And they, they, they did ask questions about the, it being done in a controlled way because of what was happening in the country at the time with these fields burning into like a new area. Um, there were suggestions that these were some of the attempts that were done land clearing and dealing with some of those pests in the soil. So um, it can set the factor and we provide the uh, mechanism for the animal health unit to liaise with. Um, the, the court to see how much of that we can now do. But the reality is that is what happened at first. It was not taken on on stream at the time as I have discovered. So we are seeking to reset those things and we crave your indulgence and we will provide a forum in a very short time for the court to lay with health. They have the animal health unit to um, address their concerns. Because it, it, they have more of a stake in the whole thing, right? And they ought to have a right to um, lend their voice to the resolution of those situations. So, Mr. Solomon, I will, within the next few days, facilitate that forum with you to have that done. But we can't change, I can't change what will happen in the past. Right? Right. We invite the department unit to present. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We all have protocols already established. I would just like to make a push of permission just to acknowledge the birthday of my colleague and in the park program, Ms. General Kelly and wish you a happy birthday today. And thank you. Thank you. As she was supposed to be on location today, and we will see her commitment towards her work, and she's here today to present her quarantine presentation. Ms. Kelly, thank you. And I would personally like to thank the ministry for returning me back to your where I feel most comfortable with our management team. And I must say thanks to the ministry for putting me back at home. <laughs> My presentation will take this out in the form of extension services or team, extension districts, sustainable extension, or sorry, stimulus extension, props. Stimulus package comprised comparative data between 2019 2020, backyard home gardens, or outlet center stations, or plan population unit, or possible solutions, and our plans for the fourth quarter. As you were heard earlier by my colleague, the fisheries unit, but extension is not just doing the classical work. I consider the, the extension officers or the extension services to be integrated between the policy makers and our key stakeholders 
and farmers and also our other businesses units around. I would say our substation staff, they are the key and backbone towards our food security in terms of our crop production. They are the ones that will give the technical guidance to our farmers and also give the technical guidance towards our policy makers and decision makers in the government system. Our team, the old team and our new team. The old team was led by Mr. Oswald Brown and is now led by Mr. George Chuli, Ian Chapman. The old team had, what you say, four areas where we had one officer in each of the area. In extension district one, would have been Mr. Lionel Stevens. In district 2A, would have been Mr. Mark Archibald. In 2B, would have been Ronald Thomas. And in 3, would have been Mr. and Mark Adams. Now, our new team looked like we have been at least now seven officers spread through doing that classical extension. No. Um, in district, so district 1, we have Mr. Shane Jeffords and Mr. Dion Leeds. In 2A, Mr. Mark Adams. In 2B, two, two Mr. Mark Archibald. In 3C, we have Ronald Thomas. In 2A, sorry, in 3A, Kevin Jeffords. And in 3B, Mr. Stuart Sills. And our protected agricultural youth was Mr. Tony Shields and Mr. Ronald Thomas. He's now Mr. Thomas. And to be fair, I have been hearing all the complaints that extension officers was somehow so not seen them. To be fair to my officers, not to be fair to the officers. When we have officers, now four officers in the classical extension, we have over 427 registered farmers. You do the maths, that's almost 120 farmers, 112 farmers, somewhere there about now with this we know we're not fully there yet, but we are cutting down the numbers. We are now doing something like you say, 60 something farmers per officer. So we are cutting it in half with our new approach. Um, would you say some of the highlights that were and uh, some of our constraints that were impeding our crop development and crop production for 2020 versus 2019? Well, of course, some of the highlights we have seen the launch of community gardens throughout the program, and Madam T is telling me to move on, but just to highlight that we have established four community gardens in total, one in victory, and three will be three that we just, just recently launched during our World Food Day celebrations. Our stimulus district looks similar to this, and just moving right into our crop production data analysis will be comparative. 2019 and 2020, we have seen a 57% reduction as it relates um, to the first three quarters of the year. This could be attributed, but not only to certain factors, of course, the COVID 19 pandemic, where farmers were restricted access to their farms during that initial stage of the lockdown. Also, to attribute to factors such as the drought that was being experienced. And again, contributing to the um, COVID 19 or something, we were having that much access to certain seeds because we were unable to get to our supplier in a timely manner so that we could have gotten some certain varieties of seeds. So we were seeing today, and this could be some of the factors now, saying that the total factors for the decline in production, and of course, it is one of the reasons to address the drought um, situation. We will be doing some water harvesting projects in the upcoming plans for 2021 to address this issue where well, we know that the system called the savings opposed to many of our sister island neighbors where at least 80% to 90% of the farmers are rain fed. So we will be developing some water harvesting catchments to try to address this need and of the farmers so that they can have to this is our one and key element in their crop production. That is what, as you can see, the data shows that um, potato was significantly down in terms of this, but one really stands out to me for the 
this and show that they were an area of focus for us is pineapple. The data showed that there were no pineapple production in 2019 and 2020. And of course, the big highlight will be in 2020 we see a 100% increase in the um, production of the accuracy of the data collected. Uh, from our, our centers and stations, we will see the highlights of storage of over 4,600 pounds of carrots as we purpose our in the district two, and the continuous production of seedlings in trees for farmers, facilitated and the care of families for farmers in the annual greenhouse and storage of over 4,000 pounds of carrots during the first two quarters in the chair and the town and all the centers. Some of our constraints um, on the centers will of course continue through the lockdown where at the first of the center a plot of Watermelon and corn were often affected due to the staff was unable to attend to the crop during its most critical development time of the crop. Um, I'm going to from the plant propagation unit. The main areas of activities for the plant propagation unit will be gathering, budding, grafting, composting, and doing some whole garden extension. The total sales of fruit trees from this plant propagation unit. You'll see some 758 fruit trees that was sold during the first quarter and you'll see that this was a significant job during the second and third quarter. Again, we have to and contribute to our activity to the 2019 or the 2019 our possible solution, of course, we will be improving our extension delivery to the farms. And I can say, yes, we are synergy and we are, um, we will be, we will have to change and we will change our delivery service to the farms. Um, continue to spread the benefit of our low, eating local produce and we will be using an interactive approach of trying to use all necessary social media and platforms that is a hit to us to do this delivery. Um, so the plans for the upcoming of this fourth quarter will be our continual monthly forecasting extension visits, our capital rental trial at both the lab experimental station and the tabernacle or the center, of course our local bigger activities and focus on our 2021 work plans. And thank you. Please indicated, we now spread the message, be local first and continue to be local. And continue to be just like our dear my friends, this is our Facebook page and the agriculture, saying it, and hashtag you great, you wait, catch it. It's time for questions. Please, if I could ask you, 
expression is that a building is only as strong as a foundation. You were the first building in the world that an interactive approach to all food security. That this isn't also involved in major options stakeholders such as the cooperatives in our plan. It's not going to be exclusive and we're not going to push anything down the line. So we are going to involve them in all our delivery and decision making processes to them. And highlights the compliance unit 
has a system the Oracle project in soil sampling. Going a little further is that we are into like map reading and doing all types of map work. So they wanted us to assist in soil sampling and getting data for them. That data it was probably in the position and possession of the coordinator for the Oracle project, which he was formerly in. Mr. Osborne Bob, I'm not sure who is in charge of that project now or is the project finished. Our challenges, and we have numerous challenges, um, especially our um, the commission of our vehicle, which we use to use as um, basically to serve, um, surveillance to the whole island to pinpoint of squatters uh, on the comb lines, which basically kind of slows down because it's all a vehicle issue. Also, he, he had some lands that were unveiled we call it. back in 2016. We did an assessment where we realized that up to almost 100% of agriculture lands were taken or in use, or sometimes uh, just real. This is, a, uh, this is basically a data which has been going on for years, or something going on for years, and we need to get that process rectified as soon as possible. Uh, the ideas are, uh, the ideas, challenges with ideas, and uh, we are being kept out of the loop, in front of our heads of what is going on, with these lands and we were just being thrown up there just to think on it and give reports of any land and our way it was not to take it seriously. We had lack of technology, we didn't have much equipment or training to set to advance the unit. So that is one of the biggest challenges in the whole world. I know want to move forward of 2020. Uh, the land management unit was uh, no far. The land management unit was required uh, to make certain big units stronger and progressive for the unit to be more effective. And we are going to bring some more ideas on how to manage the land for agriculture, which has been a problem for many, many years. And we have um, put out some unique technology. We want to make the, the land management unit one more, most technological advanced unit in the department of agriculture when it comes to land management because we have certain problems with land, as I said before, over the years. And uh, one of the, uh, the, the part of technology is equipment high speed computers, uh, we have a problem over the years we are just using a normal computer which we have software, the software has been um, to be assisted by the planning unit and that's of our GMS. And also we need a drone to pinpoint and detect squatters on the agriculture land. This one here is the most important out of all, is the land policy. I think that we have an issue of loopholes in the, especially in land rental agreement, where we just found out about maybe a month ago that many farmers has not been paying their rent. They has has not been signed their lease agreements, and also they have some farmers has not just been taking land, and then there's nothing to be done about it. So I think a land policy needs to be changed to cover all those people and also strengthen the land management unit to make a little decision alongside the ministry of agriculture. Right now, the land management unit is 
to create a database, and this database should carry us to the next um, couple of years, maybe in the next 10 to 15 years. This database would have everything you can think of, including mapping, including putting up of farmers' registration, including lease agreements. And once you get this database completed, we wouldn't have to be going back into papers and all that stuff to, to say who is this farmer, where this farmer from, and what is not. And that's easily the question.
collaborative effort will be with you in the land policy because it is a lot more challenging than what is actually laid out here. We have a lot of requests for land and not enough their lands that are tied up to the whole of it. But I won't go into that just to say that there is on, um, a process that is started and the recommendations will be made to the other members of the Commission to update our land policy, right? Thank you, sir.
so far we have had no more four months of wisdom and still have availability of parts and resources. What are our challenge, challenges face? Inadequate amount of parts and resources. And that has been a problem for quite some time. Um, parts that are needed, lack of proper tools, and timely responses and adhering to our needs. Um, a lot of time we get turned down or pushed to the back. Um, and we get, they, they, they tell us all the time the money is here. That's, that's one of the major challenges we face. Um, shortage of expertise. We don't have a personal mechanic and we really would need one because at times we go to public works and sometimes I have to go there every day. We go to public works every day just to see that certain things get done. We turn down our uh, hard when parts and maintenance are really needed. Recommended solutions. I think having a certified or uh, maybe two certified mechanics on site would make a big difference. Uh, making funds available to purchase tools and parts both locally and having two new chapters and at least one old one of the would be a great help and a plus. And then to train more staff in this field because most of the times um, it's just being a chapter man enough to do whatever. We have nobody else to talk about. Future plans for the unit. Um, Practically efficiently, efficient and timely land preparation service through the remaining year and year. Keep seeking ways that means to keep machine and implements in working hard. Try new methods and techniques and plan strategies as to be more efficient and timely in rendering services to farmers. Um, we are also now going through the process of merging with the soil and conservation unit and making it one engineering unit. So that will be ongoing for, from now onwards. And then we are also preparing our plan of execution for the upcoming 2021. That's my presentation. Thank you for listening. Any questions? I should have been there already.